welcome to Dominus Ask. For those who are tuning in just tonight for the first time, Dominus Ask is a good news, good vibes website that was launched in October 2019 by Cardinal Tagle. And we have with us today our founding priest, Father Jason Laguerta. He is the director of the Office for the Promotion of New Evangelization. And I am Margo Salcedo, editor in chief of Dominus Ask. And in depth is a, an attempt of Dominus Ask to. Uh, inspire us to dig deeper into the Catholic faith. And the topic that we chose for our first season is the first missions in the Philippines. And if you have been following our previous episodes, you will know that we have already had um, in-depth discussions with Augustinians, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, the Recollects. And now we have um, the society that formed no less than Pope Francis and Cardinal Tagle, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. And we have the honor today of having with us the Provincial Superior of the Society of Jesus, uh, Father Primitivo Virai Jr., a.k.a. Father Jude. Welcome, Father, to Dominus S. Thank you. Thank you, Welcome, Father Jude. Father, as I did with the other superiors, I did some cyber stalking. And if I may uh, possibly introduce you, Father, he is an economics graduate actually from the University of the Philippines. Father Ekon din po ako, but Lasal. Ah, <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Uh, and then he joined the society in 1984. And um, true to his economics background, he actually has a master's in rural development from the University of the East, UE, but not in the Philippines, in Norwich, UK. <laughs> UE in UK. And then a, a doctorate in developmental studies in 2003. Father, you know, see Father Jason also has a doctorate. Is it also in DevStud, Father Jason? Social psych in UP, Father. Uh, Social psych naman po. And then uh, Father June was update, ob, ordained to the priesthood in 1995. Father, you know, you look so young, but we're carbon dating you. And then he became a parish priest, not in Manila, not in Cebu, but in... Zamboanga, Sibugay. Wow, Father, ang layo po nang narating nyo. And then, he taught economics at the Ateneo de Zamboanga. So, I hopefully, we have viewers from Zamboanga um, before becoming local superior uh, in Zamboanga, Sibugay also. Uh, and then, he became rector of the Leola House of Study. So, he's always been a formator. Uh, and then, from Zamboanga, Sibugay, he went to Ateneo de Naga. Uh, in 2011, and, the, the, and then he became superior of the Jesuits in Naga. This was a few years back before becoming the 12th provincial superior of the Philippine province of the Society of Jesus in 2017. He was appointed by Superior General, or do you call him Father General? Uh, Father Arturo Sosa. So that's my short introduction of Father June Virai. So welcome po. And we're so excited to learn about St. Ignatius from you. Father, baka po you can enlighten us on um, St. Ignatius and the Jesuit um, spiritual exercises. Thank you, Margo. Thank you, Father Jason, for this opportunity. So I hope to be able to share a little about St. Ignatius uh, and, it's, and his relevance to the present context. Okay. So is it all right if I uh, share the screen? Para yes, sa of course, Father. So it's just an introduction. There are many things, and we, we have only a very short time. So uh, I thought uh, I'd prepare a little. So una, what is the Society of Jesus? Diba? It is a Roman Catholic international religious order of men whose members are called Jesuits. Kaya Society of Jesus, SJ. Pag nakita mong SJ, uh, Indian Saksin eh, Jehovah, uh, Society of Jesus siya. Kaya uh, yun yung initial namin. Ito yung famous picture ni St. Ignatius nung siya ay naging general na. Of course, Billy Moore. Ang flow na it's lost. So I say we fight. Ang flow na it's Can you hear? Yes, Father. 
wants to go to Jerusalem and beg his way there like the Holy Pilgrims of old. But he follows your lap. What will people say? Wow! Teka, teka, father, bakit ko may girl? Ayan ang interesante kung bakit may girl. Siyempre, no? Ignatius of Loyola. He is a Basque. A Basque is a region north of Spain. Uh, by the way, St. Ignatius was born around 1490s. So they cannot partake 1490-91. Interesting that when you saw that, uh, that uh, picture na meron, he was in a battle. That's the Battle of Pamplona uh, in northern Spain. They were battling, the Spanish were battling the French for territory. Uh, as usual, nagagawa ng lupa between France and Spain. So Ignatius was leading uh, the troops of Spain. And they were, uh, you know, they were, they were a small force compared to the French. And so the, the castle was attacked by the French. And Ignatius defending, sabi niya, uh, will defend the castle, but he got wounded in battle. So, very interestingly, ito was happening in 1521. If you remember, 1521 is a marker for the Philippines because uh, Ferdinand Magellan arrived no, uh, in the Philippines in March. This happened in May of 1521. Ignatius was doing his own battle against the French troops. Uh, he was wounded. He was wounded in battle, and he had to be brought home to recuperate and to do quarantine. Meron na silang quarantine nung un- unang panahon. Anyway, so um, Ignatius, a very vain man, seeking fortune, seeking fame, seeking to be in the court of the king. And he had great love for women. Oh, bye! Oh. Ah. Kita mo talagang... Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he had wanted to win the hearts of the women in court. No? And he was very vain. And nakalagay dito nga in his writings, in his own autobiography. It's not an autobiography, but it's it's really written in the third person. And in his uh, beginning of the injury in the battle, he says here, and I will read to you, until the age of 26, when he was doing this, he was a man given to the vanities of the world. And his chief delight used to be in the exercise of arms with great and vain desire to gain honor. So kung ngayon pa, mahilig ito sa barrel. Doon dati, mahilig sa weapon. So, he was very much uh, delighted, delighted in arms, wanted to be famous and everything else that the world could offer. Okay, bara ako. <laughs> Talagang ko, no? So, very exciting yung buhay. So, he tried uh, his very best uh, to gain that, no? But unfortunately, this event that happened in the Battle of Pamplona made him uh, injured, badly injured, that he was supposed to die, you know? The, 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 uh, the doctors then were saying, no, he might not live. If he survives that night, he would, he would, uh, he would uh, be okay. But uh, as it is, you know, uh, he prayed, had a devotion on that feast of St. Peter and Paul to St. Peter, and he asked that uh, if his life could be uh, spared. No? So he went to confession, and, uh, uh, and then... Fortunately, by God's grace, he was healed, no? Uh, but, but, hindi ibig sabihin na na-healed siya. His soul was also healed. Hindi pa. Kasi when he started to get well, all the thoughts of vain glory and were there, there it was still with him. Eh, sa battle, his right leg 
a cannonball hit right between his legs and one of his legs was damaged. It was crippled. So they had to set it back to right place, no? Eh, unfortunately, mali-mali ang pagdugtong nila when they were bringing him home to his home in Loyola. Pamplona is uh, far, a little far away from, from uh, Loyola, his hometown. So the doctors had not set it correctly. So sabi ni San Ignacio, eh bakit ganon? Bakit hindi tuwid yung pa ako? How will I, how will I stand? Yes. Uh, how will I stand in front of the courts when my leg is crippled? Break the leg to, to show and to put it right again. So, eh, wala namang anesthesia noong unang panahon, di ba? So, he had it out of vanity because the boots will not fit in his leg. He had, uh, he had it broken again so that they can be joined correctly. So, ganong wow. taba ni Dios po. Oh. Itong, pwede pala siya, kung ngayon po pala siya, pwede siya magpa-bellow beautiful. <laughs> ah. Tapos noon, uh, he was recuperating. Unfortunately, the second time around, yung leg may protruding bone. Sabi niya, hindi po pwede. So how can I, you know, do it again? He had his legs again sawed and then put back. Ako the sakit leg. po noon! For the sake of vanity, for the sake of the world, glory, fortune, fame. Ganon si San Ignacio. Mapusok, very passionate, uh, hard-headed, and stubborn. But as things go, that the Lord uh, changes us, di ba? Yung mga hulog ng langit ng mga experiences, di ba? So ito yon. Quarantine siya, and he recovered. No? Pero habang nagka-quarantine, like all of us, di ba parang... Ano nangyayari pag quarantine, hindi ka lumalabas ng bahay? You can get bored, di ba? Parang, ano na naman gagawin? No? Quarantine no. naman, di ba kalabas, di ba kapunta sa mall, hindi makapaglakwat, you cannot see friends. That was what was happening to Ignatius. He was getting bored. And so he said to those servants and to those taking care of him, can you give me some books that I will read about chivalry, about night, about... Uh, night saving damsels in distress, portly appearances, and so on. Eh, sabi nung nag-aalaga sa kanya, eh, sir, wala eh. Wala tayo niyan dito sa bahay eh. But I have, I can give you the lives of saints. Mm -hmm. The lives of saints. I want books so of saints shit. at the time. Oh, pero, well, board na board, nagsimula siya magbasa. He started to read the lives of the saints. And he became quite fascinated with the lives of the saints. And he began to read about St. Francis of Assisi. You, I know you interviewed uh, the Franciscan. Then yes, he, he also began to marvel at the things that St. Dominic, uh, what St. Dominic was doing. And he says here in his autobiography, while reading the lives of our Lord and our saints, he started to he would stop to think reasoning with himself. How would it be if I did this, which St. Francis did, and this, which St. Dominic did? And he found them good, you know, even if it was difficult. So may nababago na dahan-dahan, may nababago na kay San Ignacio. Pero, hindi naman biglaan ang conversion, di ba? As with all of us, di ba? Dahan-dahan, di ba? Hindi naman tayo biglang santo lang. So, while he was thinking about this, it was very nice, and so, but he would get bored. I mean, you know, okay, wala well, yung books of chivalry. Mas maganda yung books of chivalry of dreaming about women, you know, being in court, getting fame and fortune. So, pag-iisipan niya kasi wala nga yung mga libro. He would dream about rescuing, uh, you know, uh, being uh, attached to a woman and so on. Well, I'm sorry, so Oh, kaya yun yung nakita mo dun sa, kita ninyo dun sa uh, trailer. He had involvement in his life, no? Even even before uh, before his conversion. Parang Saint so, Augustine din. Yes, exactly. Uh, so, but ito yung gift ni Saint Saint Ignatius. The Lord was very kind to him, and his gift is something that all of us share. It's not only the Jesuits; it's the whole church. 
the ba, saints are given to us in particular points of the church history. St. Francis, St. Dominic, St. Augustine. They are meant to help us to become closer to God. Ang binigay ng Diyos kay San Ignacio, una, was the gift of discernment. Di ba, nagagamit natin madalas yan. O, mag-iisip ka kung ano yung dapat gawin, how to act in the situation, what choices do I have to make in life. We do discernment, di ba? You're familiar with the, with the term, di ba? It seems to be such a big Jesuit word, discernment. Parang when I was reading up, it kept saying discernment, discernment, discernment. It's really parang, is it really part of the Jesuit way? Uh, it's the Ignatian way. Kasi the Jesuit, Ignatian way. Oh, Jesuits follow Ignatius. But Ignatius does not give it to the Jesuits only. He gives it to the church. So yung discernment, in, in the early life of Ignatius, he was beginning to find out, ano ba itong discernment na ito? Ito yung kwento ng mga tales of chivalry and tales of the life of saints. When he would start to think about yung mga knights uh, doing these great things for, for glory and so on, he would enjoy them. Parang kung ganda yun. Dapat yun ang ginagawa ko. Pero cool. after a while, oh, cool siya. Ang ganda nun. After a while, after reading, sabi niya, it left him empty. Parang, uh, parang, it's worldly. Oh, parang okay. Yeah, it was nice when you thought about it. But it, parang, okay. But when he would read the lives of the saints, the lives of Christ, reflect on them, if he would do as St. Dominic did, or as St. Francis did, it would give him also a, a very deep sense of joy and peace in his life. And he realized, after reading and reflecting on them, his heart was not empty. It was peaceful and it was joyful. Yun na yung discernment. Pumasok na ngayon yung pagkilatis sa Pilipino ba, pangingilatis. We begin to discern the movement of the Spirit in our lives, which is coming from God and which is coming from the evil spirit. What leads us closer to God and what leads us away from God. So Ignatius was discovering how God was teaching him to discern the Spirit. Yung spiritual conversation niya was his way of evangelizing. And he did not know it, but he was just speaking things about God. And people were saying, oh my no, uh, they found him to be, they found a lot of joy and peace conversing to him. So while he was, while he was now on pilgrimage, he went to Montserrat, Manresa, people started to follow him. Parang di ba, pag nakakita ka ng isang banal na tao, gusto mo, ano, ano pa, paano mo ba ako tutulungan para maging mas malapis sa Diyos? Ganon yung dating ni San Ignacio. He was listening, he was simply listening to people and telling them about God. But he had no ed- education. I, I listened to the uh, uh, Father Jared speak about the uh, preparation of, of uh, their order, di ba, na kailangan ipinag-aralan. Bishops, only bishops at that time could, could, could preach, di ba? Uh, priest could not even preach, lalo na pag lay person. Pag nagsalita ka about things about God, about sin, that's what got Ignatius into trouble. He was called in by the Inquisition. But why are you speaking about mga tungkol sa kasalanan? Eh, wala kang mga pinag-aralan. Sino ka ba? O kulong? So, this kinulong. was when he was in France po ba? Is that when, when it happened? So I, when, that, he studied po in Sorbonne, di ba? He studied in several places, from Spain to France, and, and to Sorbonne was the college in the University of Paris. So he studied in the, then the University of Paris was the, umaga, the Ivy League of, of, the, of Europe at that time. He was just there, kasi nga, sabi niya, how can I evangelize? How can I preach? They will not allow me to preach. If I preach, they put me in, in prison. So sabi niya, uh, Hindi ako pwedeng pilgrim lang. Pilgrim in the sense of uh, wanderer, speaking about things of, uh, to God, uh, of God to people. Kailangan mag-aaral ako. So nag-aaral siya at 33 years old, sitting with young students. Mga yeah, young anyone students. Anyone can learn. High school anyone. pa. To learn Latin and so on. So ayun, at 33 years old, he was sitting in a room, learning Latin and so on. 
because he wanted to have the education to be able to preach the word of God. And then, di ba po later on, he was called pa master kasi parang nagka master's degree pa po siya, di ba? Yes, yes. So, but uh, I'm also interested po, so he was influenced by, uh, in his readings on the on the book of, of about the saints, he was influenced by St. Francis, St. Dominic, and then he was also influenced po by St. Benedict the time that he was in Montserrat. Ah, nung nagbabagong buhay na siya, nung sabi niya, magpipilgrim ako. Kasi uh, Loyola is in the north of Spain. Tapos uh, Montserrat is down south in the area of Catalonia, the area of Barcelona. No? So sabi niya, pipilgrimage siya. And he went to, uh, to go to Manresa, he had to go by uh, Montserrat. Montserrat is the, uh, the Abbey, no? the Benedictine Abbey. Uh, and there he spent uh, his days uh, in prayer and penance. And that's where the famous uh, 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 Black Madonna is. Diba? Alam siguro ni Father Jason, ito yung Black yeah. Madonna. Montserrat. Serrated Mountains, diba? Parang ganun-ganun yung mountain. So the Abbey is right, uh, parang right, uh, built from the side of the mountain. So very impressive view. And the Black Madonna is there. And that's when Ignatius laid down his arms. The offer. Kaya pag nakikita nyo yung picture ni Saint Ignatius short, he is giving it to the Our Lady uh, because the Lady appeared to to him when he was recuperating in a vision, and then sabi niya, "I will, um, you know, give my loyalty to the Eternal King." So he laid down his arms, he gave it up, he took out his uh, his uh, clothes, his nobility, uh, he gave it to a beggar, and he took on the beggar's uh, clothing. So, and the Benedictines were very helpful to him in guiding him, uh, hearing his confession. And so he started this pilgrimage now. And then was this also where he started his very famous spiritual exercises? Was that where he wrote it, book? That's the next in interesting thing. From Montserrat, he traveled all the way down from Loyola to Montserrat, and then Montserrat to Manresa. Manresa apparently is a very uh, sleepy, sleepy place then. Uh, now it is not. It's become a center for, for Jesuit retreats and so on. So he found a cave in Manresa where here God was instructing him like, as a, uh, like a child. Kasi wala nga siyang formal teaching. Tinuturuan uh, siya. And this is, what, this is where... The, as a lay person, he started to write the spiritual exercises. Amazing, di ba? Uh, no, no, no background or anything, but the Lord was teaching him. And I have here you know, the spiritual exercises, yes. Spiritual exercises, which is the core of our spirituality, Ignatian spirituality. It is where Ignatius puts his spiritual ex exercises. It's like a cookbook. Uh, <laughs> For life for life, for buhay, hindi mo pwedeng basahin ang spiritual exercises parang, parang novela no? or uh, a serious book for reading. It is meant to be uh, understood, prayed over, and practiced. Kaya, Slow cooking. Yeah, for cooking. You're cooking your own life. No? Uh, kaya for the Jesuit, for us, it is the core of our life. No? Early on, as novices, we do the 30-day spiritual exercises. 30 days of quiet uh, following the program set by uh, Ignatius for four weeks of the spiritual exercises where God is forming us, helping us to gain our spiritual freedom so we can be who we are as children of God and we can be free to serve God and to serve others. So, this is where you start to see God more clearly, follow yes, Him more nearly. Love Him more dear. <laughs> I love Him so more dear. Like life coach. Uh, parang life coach, so mentoring. Pero ang mentor mo ang Holy Spirit. Wow! May tatalo pa ba doon? <laughs> because Ignatius, like uh, the other uh, speakers that you've had before, Father Jared, is very 
in, in that time of the church when only the bishops or supposedly learned people can speak about the things of God, Ignatius and like the other saints, that's why they were put to question. Kasi sabi niya, Ignatius sabi niya, eh nagsasalita ang Diyos sa akin eh. Eh bakit, bakit, uh, bakit hindi, di ba? Mahal tayo ng Diyos. The Lord speaks to us. Tayo, we take that for granted, di ba? Na kinakausap tayo ng Diyos. Father, ako interested po ka, Father, dun sa ano, what you said about Ignatius not intending to found um, a congregation or a group. But uh, how did it evolve? Paano siya naging ano, society of Jesus? Time when he was doing his studies in, in, in Paris, um, one of the most difficult na makuha niya na, na naging the great saint that he was was Francis Xavier. Francis Xavier came from also a noble family. Sabi niya, sino itong kumag na ito na matanda na nag-aaral pa tapos hindi naman bright mas bright pa ako dito <laughs> and he was talking about spiritual things so also Francis Xavier well, well ayaw niyang aminin na si Saint Ignatius there's something about this guy but he started to have friends kaya nga ang, ang, ang Society of Jesus the more accurate uh, name like the other congregations is Compania uh, It's a company. It's a a group, uh, if you like, uh, Parcada, the same word that was used by uh, uh, Father Gerard, di ba? Yung Parcadahan that yes. you used, di ba? Yes. Ito, Ignatius had companion, companions with him who shared the desire to follow the Lord. So, and then he started giving the spiritual exercises to them. And it changed their lives. It changed their lives. Sabi niya, how about us banding together? Let's go to Jerusalem. Uh, let's just be pilgrims. Let's, uh, let's uh, bring people to God by talking to them about, about, about God. Now we have our degrees. We can be allowed to preach. But we will live simple lives. We will not have any vows, but we will live uh, in poverty We will live in, uh, with our private vows of chastity. They didn't even think about obedience then, you know. Their leader was Ignatius, so they followed him. So they were going to Jerusalem. But unfortunately, with many of the wars there at that time, diba? many of the crusades, everything was very perilous going to, to the Holy Land. So they were not able to go to the Holy Land, they were based in Venice. And what were they doing in Venice? Hindi sila nagogondola doon. No? Uh, in, in Venice, they were, they were ministering to the poor and the sick. Aside from preaching, they were doing what the Lord was doing. Uh, teaching, healing, ministering to the poor, and so on. Yun yung buhay nila. Father, um, There's also a description that um, the Society of Jesus is also um, parang obedient to the Pope. Um, which is, is that something that's very specific to St. Ignatius? I and mean, how, um, how did he get there? How did he come to that kind of um, uh, f- fidelity to the, to the Pope? They went into discernment ngayon, again. They started say, ano ba talaga ang tawag ng Diyos para sa atin? That's always the important question in the sermon. Where is the Lord calling me? Where is the Lord calling our small group? And they went to many days of prayer and they arrived at that decision. We will offer ourselves to the Holy Father wherever He will send us. So, nagsimula na. Uh, so they offered, and the, so the Holy Father start when they offered, they started, uh, he started sending them, and then they decided, if we are to be effective, then we will have to form ourselves formally, so that we have, uh, kumbaga, authorization from the from the Holy See, no, from the Vatican, na uh, they could be recognized. They will not be persecuted because they were persecuted. Uh, parang hindi uh, naman kayo bona fide religious order kung ano nung pinagagagawa ninyo. How did they so, end up in Rome, Father? Uh, yung barkadahan. 
uh, uh, did they, so they went, saan sila uh, nag-ano, nag-settle down yung original group? So they offered, they, they went to Rome, offered themselves, and the religious congregation was formed. But uh, immediately, they were scattered, not scattered. So Ignatius had wanted to evangelize, go, go over the, the world, go to new lands, because it was the time of discovery, diba? of different lands. No? Uh, so, but Ignatius was chosen by the group to be their leader even if Ignatius did not want. No? So, tinanong nga siya, how do you want our, our group to be called? Uh, if you have the Franciscans, you have the Dominicans, how do you want to be called? Eh, Ignatius, ayun ko nga, Ignatian. No, Ignatian. No, it's not about me, it's about Jesus, Jesus. So, it's a society of Jesus. It's a company of Jesus. Um, uh, there's a very beautiful uh, Stage in the life of Ignatius and very inspiring and I'll share it's a, just a bit about it in, when he, they were going to Rome to offer themselves to the Holy Father uh, Ignatius came by a very small chapel uh, in La Storta not very far from Rome very small chapel and there he had a very great vision and the vision was Ignatius saw God the Father telling Jesus, his son, was accompanied by his mother, and Jesus was carrying the cross. And he said, the father said to, to his son, Jesus, I want you to place this man with you uh, in the cross. You know? uh, to place me, to place him to be in your company. He and again, company of Jesus. So, uh, he wants us to share. And that is why, as Jesuits, although we are afraid, when we say, Lord, place us with your son, ibig sabihin nun, uh, isama mo kami sa krus mo. Eh, kaya, oh no, sabi ko, are we really ready to be persecuted and humiliated like Christ? Well, Ignatius asked for that, and I think we should ask for it as well. So, in that very moment, the... He was very inspired and said, yes. Uh, and he heard from God, uh, I will be propitious to you in Rome. I will be favorable to you in Rome. So when he went to Rome, he offered the, the group. The Holy Father accepted. It will take some time to be formalized. But the Holy Father uh, started sending them uh, to different places. No? Uh, and of course, you know, St. Francis Xavier went all over the world. You know? uh, yeah. Ignatius, being the uh, leader, uh, much as he wanted to go to many, many places around the world, siya yung naging commander, parang commander-in-chief. He was stuck in Rome uh, to do the administrative uh, function of directing this growing up. No? As the years went on, uh, it started growing. And for Ignatius, what was key, because it was a time of the Protestant Reformation, uh, uh, Protestants had, had rightly protested against the abuses of the church. Even the clergy was ignorant. So Ignatius said, kailangan education. Kailangan uh, nag-aaral ang uh, mga pare with the right morals and, and also the young people. So he started now to build schools. And when they were becoming very successful, the princes, the kings, king of Portugal and Spain, all of them said, we want Jesuit schools, Jesuit run schools. So Ignatius, from thinking he will be a pilgrim to just speak by converse, special conversation to people, started to formalize schools and institutions so that they will have a multiplier effect. Father, for the Jesuits, there's one thing that I always hear. Well, two two things that I always hear the Jesuits. Well, maybe it's one combined thing that I always hear the Jesuits say. Magis and ad majorem dei gloriam. Could you okay. be enlightened on that? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Para, para hindi naman boring yung, yung nanonood sa atin. Balik tayo dun sa sharing of slides. Uh, is that okay? 
Oh, is, yes, Father. <laughs> this is St. Francis Xavier, known for his heart was inflamed uh, to preach the word of God. So the Jesuits are apostles who must be all things to all men and women, ready to go anywhere, live anywhere, do anything, suffer anything, be anything, use whatever means possible in order to participate in the work of God's salvation. Thus, the society has no particular apostolate. There is literally no work that a Jesuit may not do if it is for the greater glory of God. In yung AMDG, Ad Maiorem Dei Gloria. In other words, a Jesuit can discern with his superior where the Lord calls them to go. And for us, where there is greatest need, where no one would want to go, where we can make a difference, we will go there. Anything for the greater glory of God, where the Lord calls us to go. Kaya yung magis na tinatanong mo, ito yon yung greater. Uh, ad maiorem. Magis, what is for the greater glory of God? Whatever is the will of God, wherever the Lord calls us to do more, for the greater glory of God, we will go there. I love that it's not just for the glory of God, but for the greater glory of God. Kaya nga, it's important, it's not mediocre. Diba? Pag gumagawa ka ng trabaho, dapat buong-buo, no? Hindi, oh, pwede na yan. Paminsan, di ba tayong Pilipinas, ang sabi natin, eh, pwede na yan, pwede pasar, oh, pwede na yan. Hindi po pwede yun. If you're doing something for God, it has to be for the greater glory of God. It has to be the magic. Kaya pala, Father, you can find Jesuit anywhere, no? Uh, kahit music, education, prison ministry, uh, the I sick. Know. All over yeah. po kayo, Father, no? For Pope Francis po, um, why did he choose the name Francis? And um, uh, apparently, upcoming, uh, this coming October 3, I think there's going to be a new encyclical by him that's going to be released. Um, and then once again, uh, Laudato Si inspired by St. Francis, um, and then this upcoming encyclical inspired again by St. Francis. Um, is it maybe also because St. Ignatius himself was inspired by St. Francis, or, or, is, or is that something that maybe only Pope Francis can answer? Well, the Holy Father uh, uh, is a Jesuit. Uh, just a little bit of uh, uh, tidbits of uh, trivia. A Jesuit is not supposed to accept any ecclesiastical position of being a bishop. It's written in our constitution unless the Holy Father tells us. So Jesuits are really not, can say no to becoming a bishop. We say no because it's in our constitution. Ignatius knew that it would not be good unless the Holy Father himself says. Ayun. Eh si Po Francis, masunurin, eh inelect siya. So, <laughs> the little that I know when I'm reading uh, about uh, uh, Pope Francis, uh, it's really the, the inspiring life of, of St. Francis that motivated him. So, diba, when he was going to, he was asked before his proclamation, no? uh, he said uh, what, what he would choose and says Francis, okay, is that Francis Savior? No, he said, no, it's Francis of Assisi because of the life, the inspiring life of, of uh, St. Francis that really moved in. In this time of pandemic, I mean, Pope Francis has really shown exemplary leadership and has really guided us through the worst of times. And I mean, for sure, and that uh, his Jesuit formation contributed to his rising to the, uh, the occasion and um, g- helping us helping the whole world get through this terrible time in history. Kung nagdadasal ka, sabi nga ni Pope Francis, you want to bring the joy of the gospel? How do you do that? By a daily encounter with the person of Christ. There will be no joy in proclaiming the gospel if you do not have a daily encounter with Christ. What can, what, what can we Jesuits do is to continue to bring as you reflected and in our universal apostolic preferences given to us by Pope Francis, bringing people to God through the spiritual. 
accompanying the youth to have a hope-filled future, to walk in solidarity with the poor, and to help in the healing of creation. Amen. In the last Thank you so much, Father June. Thank you for enlightening us on St. Ignatius, on Magis, on Ad Maiorem Dei Gloriam, and on being a man for others. So, so thank you so much, and to our viewers, we'll be back. Welcome once again to Dominus S. And for the second half of our program, we have today uh, no less than the archivist and um, super author of the Jesuits, Father Rene Haveliana. And welcome, po, Father Rene, to Dominus S. I'm Margot Salcedo, I'm the editor in chief. And we have with us um, Father Jason Laguerta who is um, our uh, founding priest and the director for the Office for the Promotion of New Evangelization and also parish priest of the Sacred Heart of Santa Mesa. Um, I would like to introduce to our audience Father Rene. Um, however, I am looking at his uh, uh, CV, which is up. I, I just found it on a website for the Loyola School of Theology. And um, dear friends, it is 21 pages long. <laughs> Uh, we are we are um, before uh, a, a real treasure, a legend in the, a legend in the uh, arts and humanities. And in fact, Father Jason, see, Father Rene was given one of the highest um, honors recently, standing achievement in the humanities yeah, yeah, like from Ateneo. This was just last year, so uh, a well deserved. Yeah. Uh, award. Um, so, uh, Father Rene actually is a, he calls himself a dark blue Atenean because he went to uh, Ateneo since prep. Yeah. Since prep. Well, actually, All, grade one. Wala pong prep noon. Oh, wala pong well, prep noon. Well, I think was no such thing as prep. Our national hero, Jose Rizal, you consider him po um, Jesuit trained? Yeah, he was saying, yes, he's, he's, he's actually, he's actually um, blue because he was in grade school and high Not school. Not dark blue. <laughs> no, 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 no. He, 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 he flipped and he went to the Dominicans. He went to UST for his later studies. But he started in the grade school. Actually, not completely in the grade school because he started from a, from a private tutor in Binyan, then moved when he was in a, a grade school kid and then went on to what is equivalent to the high school. So, yeah. He's only blue. He's not dark blue, okay? So, kayo po, dark blue. Oh, I am blue. Rizal, I am blue. Uh, blue lang yan siya. Blue. Blue lang yan. Blue. Jose Rizal, blue. Cardinal Tagle, light blue. Light blue. Correct. <laughs> okay. That's my okay. classification. That's my, my, uh, my uh, idiosyncratic classification. So, Father Rene, aside from being a dark blue Atenean and going uh, enrolling in, in the Ateneo from, from first grade all the way to college. He also took up a doctorate in ministry uh, in California at the Pacific School of Religion. Uh, and the, is it called Father the Graduate, of the Graduate Theological, School, Union? Theological Union? Because the Graduate Theological Union is this big consortium of, I think, about a dozen or more schools both uh, Catholic and, and Protestant. So the Franciscans are there, part of it. The Franciscan School of Theology, the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley is also part of it. So, but and, more than that, Father Jason, see Father Rene also studied biblical languages at the Pontifico, Pontificio Instituto Biblico in Rome. Yeah, but that was, that, was, that was an older career move. Mostly not my move, but mostly mo the moves of superiors because... Uh, I have a, a facility for languages, so they said, "I'm a biblical scholar, ka." But you know. So, maybe. do you speak Hebrew, Father? I or can Greek? read. I can read it. I can speak Latin. I can and and uh, I I can read Greek. I can read Hebrew. But but you know, wow. they speak it. Kung practice, and so and modern Hebrew is also very different from biblical Hebrew. Uh, 
Uh, That's very uh, fascinating. Because I, I remember watching on YouTube see Scott Han, and he said that he studied Hebrew specifically to read uh, the Bible in its original form. So you can uh, actually read it in its original form. Yeah, I mean, I can, yeah. But um, more than um, learning about biblical languages, uh, Father Rene has specialized in the arts. Uh, and he has authored and contributed to many um, books on culture and the arts. And today, uh, he is, aside from being um, a professor in fine arts at the Ateneo, he is also the province archivist of the Philippine province of the Society of Jesus. And today, he is going to enlighten us on history, uh, on the arrival of the Jesuits in the Philippines, uh, as well as the legacy of the Jesuits in the first 500 years of Christianity. Yeah. So, welcome po, Father, to Dominus S. Thank you so much Thank for you. your time. Okay. So, for the past uh, uh, episodes, uh, we have been talking about the first Filipino missionaries, uh, or rather, the first missionaries, uh, religious congregations, uh, Dominicans, Je uh, Franciscans, and Augustinians, and Recollects, and now the Jesuits. So, we would like to learn something about the arrival of the Jesuits uh, as we celebrate the 500 years of Christianity. All right, so uh, maybe the first thing is we have to go back uh, before 1581 when the Jesuits arrived in the Philippines. That was in September. They arrived here together with uh, three of them, together with the first Bishop of Manila, Domingo de Salazar, they were on the same boat. We go back earlier, a few more uh, years, in the beginning of the Society of Jesus when St. Ignatius made a supreme sacrifice of his life. Okay? His best friend was St. Francis Xavier. Now, there, he had promised the, the king of Portugal to send a missionary to Goa. But that uh, Jesuit got sick. And so Ignatius said, what do I do? And Francis said, send me. So even if he uh, felt, you know, I'm going to lose you, you're very talented, you're here in Rome, uh, go. He, he sent him. And, and he arrived in, in Goa, and that really began the big missionary effort of the Jesuits. You know, when St. Ignatius uh, founded the Society of Jesus, he did not have a 100% blueprint in his head. I think, I think Father uh, uh, June Verai may have told you that. You know, he, he always talked to himself as a pilgrim. I'm on the way. And as they say, he discovered what God wanted him by daily life decisions. And that was a big decision to send Francis Xavier. It actually opened the big missionary enterprise of uh, the Catholic Church in this part of the world, in Asia. You know? so, so by the time the Jesuits had arrived here, there was already a presence actually in Goa. There was also a presence uh, in Macau because the first uh, initiative really of uh, the Asian missions uh, was instigated by the King of Portugal. Okay? Now, um, the Philippines, the first Jesuits here arrived in 1581. Uh, they left from Mexico. They started as four Jesuits. Uh, the, um, the superior was Antonio Cedeno, and then there was another priest, he's Alonso Sanchez, and then, then they, they had a brother, Nicolas Gallardo. There was a fourth person, a scholastic, he was simply, he was known as the brother of Francisco Suarez. So Suarez of Toledo. And he, uh, he unfortunately died on the journey. And uh, as, as what they did before, if you died on the journey, they throw you overboard because they could not allow a rotting corpse in, in, a, in, a, in the small ships because it would infect everybody. So when the Jesuits arrived here, they arrived in September. It was the typhoon season. They could not land in Manila. So the Jesuits had to this, and, the, and everybody had to disembark in, uh, basically in Sorsugon. And they journeyed on foot for almost a month, passing basically through Franciscan territories. The Franciscans were here much ahead. Now, the Franciscans were very, very intelligent. When they, when they mapped out their mission from uh, Laguna all the way to the Bicol region, they made sure that between each mission station, the most you will travel is one day. So that if you live in the morning, you're there by the afternoon. So you don't have to sleep on the road. So in other words, the Franciscans, you might say, built the first hotel chain. Uh, for this <laughs> Airbnb. <laughs> Airbnb, that's right. So, so the Jesuits and, and, and Salazar went, walked, walked on foot, or maybe they may have 
taken some horses. We don't know. But anyway, took them a journey until they reached my high. And from my high, they went down to Ba'i, which is in, which is in the uh, Laguna. And from there, they took a bangka all the way to Manila. That's, that's, how, that's how the mission began. And, uh, now, when the Jesuits arrived, the city of Manila, what we call today Intramuros, uh, did not have a wall yet as we know it today. Its only defense was kind of made out of wood, or call it a palisade. And there was no more property for the Jesuits to, to, to be there because it had all been apportioned to the pioneers, basically the, the Augustinians who arrived with Legaspi, and then the, the Franciscans who arrived earlier than the Jesuits. So the Jesuits had to find a place uh, in a, what, what, what was then known as Lagyo. Where is Lagyo? That's roughly where the Diamond Hotel is in Ermita. That's where, that's where they stayed. And they stayed there for almost uh, two years until finally a group of um, citizens in Manila decided to donate 14 lots that were, uh, uh, you know, neighboring uh, each other. Contiguous. Contiguous. Mm -hmm. And then they gave it to the Jesuits. Now, that property is now occupied by the Pamantasan ng Lonsod ng Manila. That's the very oh. first Jesuit property. Uh -oh. That's also where the first church of the Jesuits uh, was made, no? The uh, first church was called Santa Ana. Later on, became San Ignacio in 1626 because the Santa Ana church uh, uh, collapsed during a series of earthquakes. The, the present San Ignacio, which was partially restored by the uh, Muslim administration, is, I call that Ignacio II because that's really the 19th century San Ignacio. It was an earlier one. And its foundations are somewhere there in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, under Pamatasan Luso de Manila. There was a time when a group of us tried to explore using a map and, and figuring out where exactly the church was. Uh, my own calculation says that the main altar is underneath the toilet. Of, <laughs> oh my goodness, that's, hor that's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> from, 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 the, from the plants that I know, and then we tried to measure and say, Mokang nandito siya. That's that's history. Oh no. Okay. Oh, but I so, thought Father the uh, in Intramur. I thought there was like the first San Jose Seminary. There was the yes, first also, one. It was it was also there. It was it, it was in that compound of the of the Pamantasan, you know. So you the boundary of that compound, which now uh, uh, co corresponds roughly to the 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 southern wall of Intramuros, where you have the Quartarial Gate. That's, that's, that's the era of San Jose. It was, it was a very long building, two stories, very long. Okay? So, so you had that, and then, and then you, had, you had another structure called the Colegio de San Ignacio in the church. So San Jose was only a boarding school, no? uh, ah. and it was established much, much later. Uh, the establishment date of that is 1609. Earlier established was uh, uh, Colegio de San Ignacio, 1595, together with the, with the Jesuit house which was right beside it. So uh, the Josefinos studied in the Colegio and then uh, used the church of the, of the San Ignacio for their worship. Uh, Is the that of, the College of Manila? That's the College of Manila? Yes, Pumanta it's, now, it's now occupied by Pamantasan. Oh. Uh, I was wondering, lang po, like, how did you get to the provinces if it all started mm -hmm. in Manila? Okay, so from, uh, from 1581, to 83, the Jesuits were in Manila. And then it really started with the Franciscans making an SOS. The Franciscans were opening their missions in Bicol and the Franciscans said, ah, we don't have enough people. Would you like to take over some of our missions? And so they gave us basically Antipolo. And Antipolo included places like what is now Tai Tai, later on Cainta, San Mateo, Boso Boso, so that was the, what was the very first, the, the very first set uh, of missions. So um, the Jesuits were able to say yes to the Franciscans because after uh, 1581, uh, <coughs> there was a series of arrivals in, in the Philippines and one of the most important person to arrive there was Pedro Quirino, or Cherino as they, they say, uh, um, but but and he is he is he is in a sense the very first historian of the Jesuits. He wrote Relacion de las Islas Filipinas. So here is a here is a, here is a copy of the book. Uh, is, uh, wow, I want that. <laughs> published by the uh, Filipiniana Book Guild, and it has both the it has both the Spanish and the English uh, 
Spanish transcription and English translation. It's actually available online if you look at the uh, JS Star Gut- 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 Gutenberg, and you look you look for uh, Blair and Robertson. It's one it's one of the volumes of Blair and Robertson. It's actually in there. Okay. Okay, well, I'll search it. <laughs> Yeah, search it. You'll find it. So it's one of it. it it's it's from here. Then we, we learn what what the, what had happened. So Querino is a historian. So he begins to write about the opening of the missions in in uh, in uh, in Antipolo, and then later on how he is also sent to to, to Iloilo, and he founds a uh, a mission station in what then they call Tigbawan, which actually, in my opinion, is not the town of Tigbawan right now, but really the town of San Joaquin. No, because um, the reason why he went there is because the Jesuits had a benefactor named Esteban Rodriguez de Figueroa who created what has been known as the Arca Seminary or the Endowment of San Jose Seminary. And his encomienda was actually in San Joaquin. At the time, it was called Suaraga. So I think, I think Kerino was here there in Suaraga, you know, and then and, uh, Tigbawan, the place called Tigbawan, and it, 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 Tigbaw means reeds. And if you search that area there's a lot of swamps with reeds growing no? the the tigbao reeds which is which is uh, which is still there you uh, you mean the now uh, mission father how how did it start that was also very early you know so what happened was okay in 1595 there came a, a royal decree uh, penned by philip the second and he said okay there's so many groups of missionaries now going to the philippines so let's establish some sort of uh, of order to it so he said, okay, Mindanao is hardly evangelized, right? The, the newest arrival, the Jesuits, you're there. Okay, send him there. You Augustinians, you've been here a long time already. So you stay in the places where you are. So you go, you, you have Ilocos, you have, you have, uh, you have uh, Central Plains, Pampanga, Tarlac. And then you have uh, Manila, you have Cebu, you have Panay Island, okay? So then the Franciscans, you already have Laguna, okay, all the way to the Bico regions, the Bico region that's yours. So that's, that's what happened. So it was really from, from uh, in, a, in a great sense, uh, the initiative of the King of Spain, although we do know that even before 1595, there were some sort of explorations already by the Jesuits, a... A Jesuit missionary named Valerio Ledesma had left Cebu and had gone to Butuan, did some conversions, did some baptisms, but did not really stay very long. And so kind of the mission opened and then closed again. So, so but it's really after 1595 that the missions in Mindanao, the first set of missions in Mindanao really started. And the Jesuits had the whole island until the Recoletos arrived in the 17th century. And then Mindanao was split into an east and a west. So, so... All the all the western part that fell to, under the Jesuits, all the eastern part fell fell with the Recoletos. And then, that was that was how they did they did it. Last week, Paul, we spoke with the Recollects, and um, it was mentioned that some of the areas that were assigned to them um, they got because uh, the Jesuits had to leave the Philippines uh, for was, a while. That was much later on. That was after the expulsion in 1768. But there was an earlier division in 1521, uh, I mean, 15, in, in the 16th century, when the Recoletos arrived and they were given, they were given Mindanao. They, that was also the time they were given places like, uh, like Mindoro and Palawan, you know. So the way it was in the Spanish era, the, the latecomers get the worst and the most difficult uh, islands that nobody wants. So we must swamps. Oh, because... They're going to malaria. So yeah, the Recoletos got the got the no, got the worst deal of all because they they were too they were late in coming. So father, when um when the Jesuits arrived, uh, when did you start with education? Uh, around around the time when we started the missions in Mindanao, about 1595. That's the date usually given for the establishment of the Colegio de San Ignacio. Uh, you know, technically speaking, actually the Colegio de San Ignacio is really older than UST. Uh, by, a, by a decade or so. Unfortunately, it, it ceased operation in 1768 when, when the Society of Jesus was expelled. So UST has still a distinction of being the longest running, continuously running university in the Philippines. So, and that's, that's to the credit of, the, of, of UST. So what were, what were built? What are the significant um, 
uh, moments in history or um, creations that we need to highlight instead of the first? Well, first of all, I think, I think uh, as far as the Jesuits are concerned, uh, one of the big things that Jesuits were noted for was for scholarship. Uh, with their universities, there was always a, a big push to learning. So as I said, Carino, for example, is one of, the, one of the very first historians that we have of the Society of Jesus. He was then followed by Francisco Polin, Diego de Onya, and then Padre Morillo Velarde. So these are the people who wrote, wrote about the history of the Jesuits. But very often when they wrote about the history of the Jesuits, it wasn't just about the Jesuits. Uh, they had this bigger framework. They were trying to understand uh, the Philippines, not just the work of the Jesuits, but in context. So you might say that the writing was always contextual. It's also the same way Father de la Costa writes. So when you read, for example, Father de la Costa's Jesuits in the Philippines uh, from, 18, from 1581 to 1768, you're actually reading the history of the Philippines because, because, because that, that, that is the context. Then one of the other things that they did also was they studied languages. Um, in fact, one of the most useful uh, Tagalog vocabulario was, was written by two Jesuits. Uh, uh, it's known as the Noceda y San Lucar. Okay? Juan de Noceda and Pedro de San Lucar. Pedro de San Lucar was a, a parish priest in Cavite for a very long time. He, was, he became parish priest of Indang. Many years ago, I still saw the baptismal books of Indang. I don't know if it's still there. I don't know if you have preserved this uh, treasure with a signature, Pedro San Lucar. So he was wow. there. And... Uh, uh, Noceda says that when he, when they collected this uh, dictionary, they, did, they didn't take it out just from their heads. They said, we made sure to interview at least 14 people who are knowledgeable of Tagalog, the native speakers, and they asked them, what do these words mean? He says, only when there was agreement among at least 14 people, did we put it down. If there's a disagreement, they also put it down, but they said somebody else also said this. Now, nice thing about it is, the Nusede San Lucar Dictionary, uh, they, they also said, okay, can you give me an example? How, 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 let's say, how do you use, use a word? Like, for example, uh, let's say, uh, to use let's say, a word like, 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 like. Pintura. Oh, well, that's, that's a Spanish word. Like, galit. <laughs> okay, galit. How do you use it? Galit. And then, then, very often in the Nusede San Lucar, there is a proverb or a riddle. Now, Historians or literary historians like Dr. Bienvenido Lombera studied actually these dictionaries and has been able to reconstruct for us what poetry was like, what literature was like before the coming of the Spaniards. Wow. Because, because it, it records sayings, yung mga ano tayo, yung, uh, yung tumakbo, ng, tumakbo ng malalim pag na, uh, pag, pag to, ang tumakbo ng matulin pag natinig ay malalim. You, you know, those, those things are there. You know? So, so that's one of the things. The, and then equivalently, there, there was another Jesuit. Uh, his name was Mateo Sanchez. He did something similar for Visayan. And there was a Jesuit who was, who was actually born in the Philippines. He was a mestizo. It's Domingo de Esguerra. He, he wrote also a grammar. So, so, so those are the things that they did, no? Uh, so history, studies of language, and very important, the Jesuits wrote, in a sense, scientific works, or what, what, is, what was known then as natural history, the history of nature, the story of nature. Now, there was a pioneer of that. His name was Jose de Acosta. He, uh, he, uh, he was working in Latin America, and his book became the inspiration for a Czech Jesuit from, Czech, from today, the Czech Republic. Long time ago, we called it Czechoslovakia until the, until the, the split between the, the, uh, in that country. And he was from Moravia, and uh, his name is uh, Josef Georg, Georg Kamel. And he, he wrote, he did research, again, like those, like those Jesuits a bit of old, he did not rely solely on his knowledge, but he went around and talked to people. Uh, he, he wrote his findings in Latin, and he was a very good illustrator. He also drew some of the plants. So from Camel, for example, we have some very early depictions of Santol and Luya. No? And wow. even, even an Jesuits are very much into scholarly research and, uh, and that. Now, the other thing that they also did... Uh, but 
we still have to gather really the evidence and they really don't know how to do it. But certainly Pedro Quirino said that what they did with, with, the, with the Filipinos as a way of teaching them the catechism was they got the folk songs of the people and instead of, their, uh, instead of, of the standard lyrics, they put the lessons of the catechism. Now, how did that, those songs sound? I don't know. One thing is certain though, the Passion tradition begins actually with somebody who worked for the Jesuit. He was not the Jesuit himself. He was a lay person. He, was, he worked for the Jesuit press. His name is Gaspar Aquino de Belen. He wrote the very first Passion in 1703. Now, wow. the person who kind of alerted us to the presence of Gaspar Aquino de Belen is again Dr. Lumbera because of his, his work on Tagalog poetry, which was actually a dissertation that he did for, for, for his studies in the U.S., then later on, Father Mario Francisca and I were able to get a copy of the Gaspar Aquino de Belen text and, and we worked on it. And then, and I, I, can, I can only agree with Dr. Lobel that it is, it is, it, it is an, an 18th century masterpiece of Tagalog. No? Truly. Uh, so so the, the 1814 Passion that is being chanted today during Holy Week is actually derived to, to a great extent from the 1703 of Gaspar Aquino de Belen. You can really, if you, if you put the two texts together, you can see the... Um, uh, una who, letra. Who, who, who copied uh, from whom? Who copied from whom? Okay. Yeah. I will like Aral. That Aral is, that Aral is an addition only in the chanting, but it's not in the original text. Ah, yung, wala po sa original? <laughs> unang letra, adoracion, eri naman, <laughs> resurrection. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we do that every year in Bulacan. Oh, yan. Ayan. So, so it's really Gaspar Aquino de Belen. The, the, so, so... So we also do know from other sources that, that they taught people how to paint, but it's hard to say which exactly of the remaining uh, uh, artifacts in our, in our colonial uh, and, uh, are, are from, the, from that era. See, we actually lost a lot of stuff in, over the centuries of the earlier period. Like there's hardly any silver chalice from the 16th, in the 17th century. And the reason for that is very simple. The British came to the Philippines and they asked for a ransom of 30 million, uh, whatever the currency was at that time. And the only place where the British could find it was all the silver in the churches in Intramuros. So they were all melted down. So a lot, a, lot of the, a lot of the colonial silver that we have that have been preserved, let's say in San Agustin, really come from the 1700s and the 1800s, but earlier, very, very rare to find, to find the earlier pieces. Okay, so we, we, there's, there's so much destruction, so we don't know, we don't know what was, was there earlier. Father, the Jesuits were here from, from when to when, and then well, parang okay. may break and then arrived again. Yeah, 1581 to 1768. So that was the first, the first, uh, first, um, Time that they have arrived. So, and then so, when did you arrive for again? Uh, and, 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 and in 1859. Uh, okay. So the society was was uh, first expelled from the Spanish realm and the Portuguese realm and the French realm. First, actually in Portugal, then in France, and then in Spain. So uh, the decree called the Pragmatic Sanction was was uh, signed by King Carlos, uh, and and he uh, and he. Uh, it, it, it was signed in 1767, but it took one year for the decree to come to the Philippines. So for one year, uh, the Philippines was absolutely blissfully ignorant of what had happened in Europe. So that one year, parang reprieve. The decree arrived in May by the time the governor general was Sarah on, and the Jesuits were, were, were expelled rather fast. No? So uh, by, by the end of May, they had gone to all the missions. There's... There's even a record of them going all the way to Cavite and, uh, and uh, uh, finding the priest there in one of those parishes in Indang. What was the reason for the suppression or the... Ah, it's very, very complicated. Uh, it's, it's really very political. It goes back to all the, all the what happened in, the, in Europe in the, um, in the 17th century with the, the rise of the absolute monarch. You know, at that, that time, um, the... the uh, uh, kingdoms of uh, Spain, Portugal, parts of Italy, especially uh, 
Naples, Southern Italy, and France, they were ruled by the Bourbons. Mm -hmm. The Bourbons wanted a um, very efficient uh, bureaucracy. They didn't like this idea that was there during the Habsburg, where you really have two principles of, the, of governments, church and then state. What the Bourbons wanted was a church would only now become a department of the state. Yeah. Okay? And one of the biggest opponents of that were the Jesuits. They always fought for the autonomy of the church, and uh, they were considered as uh, papal loyalists. Also. So, so that, was, that was really the big thing when you, when you think about when you think about the history, it was, it was really a, a political move on the part of the, of the uh, European crowns. Which was the first uh, church that was built by the Jesuits in the Philippines? Well, well as far as we know, the, the earliest one was in Intramuros. Uh, first of all, it was just a wooden church in 1583. Then later on, in around 1595, it was replaced by a stone church dedicated to Santa Ana. Because at that time, there were no Jesuit saints yet. So, but that Santa Ana church collapsed because of a series of earthquakes. Uh, there was a series of earthquakes in 1599. 1600, and then finally, uh, it was in such a dilapidated state, so that in 1626 or 1632, that's when the Jesuits built a new church, that's one right now, in the, uh, the place where, uh, where Pamantasa ng Rosod ng Manila is located. Mm -hmm. That was actually designed and, and the construction was supervised by an Italian uh, Jesuit architect, also a priest, his name is Gian Antonio Campioni. Father, we can't talk about, I feel like we, today at least, we can't talk about the Jesuits without talking about music. Yeah, well, actually, music is pretty much earlier. I think if you look at Carino, it says they were already much engaged in it. Uh, we have preserved, uh, actually, I found it in the, of all places, in the uh, parochial uh, archives of the Polog. We found the music done by uh, Padre Ramon Bar Baranera, who was he? He, Padre Baranera, was the, uh, there was another school that, aside from the Ateneo, that the Jesuits opened, but this one was not in Intramuros. It was in Padre Faura. It was called Escuela Normal de San Francisco Javier. It was a school for teachers because, contrary to the popular belief that it was the Americans who studied the public school system in the Philippines, the answer is no. Okay? When you read the Dolimi Tangereno Cersa clamoring for a public school, Actually, the whole system of the public school on the, on, the, on the elementary level was already started by the Spaniards. And they were known as Escuela Pia. Pia because they were funded by pious associations like, like, the, like, you know, like the La Misericordia and all like that. And um, they, it was both privately and publicly funded. And then uh, around um, uh, 18, late 1880s, the Jesuits were asked if they could train all these maestros and maestras to, to ma, to, for the public schools. And that's when they built the uh, uh, Escuela Normal in San Francisco Javier. And one of the rectors there was Father Ramon Baranera, who was also a musician. And he uh, left for us, as we discovered, a whole series of, of, of a whole mass series of, um, of, of, of uh, uh, for Christmas. Okay. It Christmas not, songs. It was no. It was a mass. It was called Misa Pastoral. Ah, okay. okay. Now, actually, a lot of people know the tune of Misa Pastoral because this was so popular in the Philippines and people kind of remember the song without knowing whoever wrote it. No? And if you're familiar with the, with the, with the, uh, the uh, song of uh, Simbang Gabi written by uh, Lucio San Pedro, the National Artist for Music from Angono. The last part of that goes, Gloria, bam, 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 Gloria, in a Chelsea. That's not an original composition of Lucius San Pedro. It's a quotation from the Misa Pastoral of Father Baranera. Ah. So, may music na. It's spread because of these teachers who were taught music, solfeggio they call them, in, in the Escuela Normal. They brought them with, with them. And somehow it has survived. It survived certainly in the Pampanga region. It survived here, I guess. So, so at a certain point, nakalimutan na kung sino sumulat. Basta kinakanta lang pag-iray ng Masyadong Gloria. Gloria. So, <laughs> Pero ngayon po, iba na kinakanta. Marinig ni Lucio San Pedro, siguro sa Muno, kinakanta din sa simbaan. So sabi niya, ay, magandang idagdag yan. 
So mm-hmm. he really is quoting from a previous work by by uh, uh, Father. By Ram- a Jesuit. By, uh, yeah. Yes, okay. but of course today the most popular Christmas song is also by an Atenean, Jose Marie Chan. <laughs> of course, Jose Marie Chan. Yeah, there's another, another thing too. Yeah, I'm not not directly in a sense the Jesuits, but actually. Uh, uh, Jesuit faculty of the Ateneo, which is also a very popular song. Uh, that's another, that's uh, No mas amor que el tuyo, corazón divino, el pueblo filipino te da su corazón. That was, that was written for the, the International Eucharistic Congress here in the Philippines. And it was written 95? by Professor Emerito Barcelon Sr., who was a very well known. Uh, lyricist and Spanish poet and taught actually in the Ateneo. His son became a Jesuit. So, like what would be the contribution of the Jesuits um, for the first 500 years? For example, po, the Recollect said that theirs was community building. So I don't know, would, would, it, would it be maybe um, formation or development of leaders for the Jesuits? You know, I think the real Jesuit contribution will go back to St. Ignatius. No? The biggest contribution of the Jesuit is the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, which is not so much a finished product, but it's a way of doing things. Understand so much of the work of the Jesuits, uh, even Pope Francis now, if you understand the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, uh, and if you understand all these things, the, the whole process of discernment, you know. So, uh, in many ways, the present Pope is... is whether he likes it or not, is, is very, very Jesuit. It's, it comes out in his talks, it comes out in his encyclical. Like, for example, uh, typically Jesuit, he does not look at this pandemic as, as, a, as, a, as, a, burden. as a problem, as a burden. No? Or, you know, they say in Chinese, uh, crisis means uh, danger, it also means opportunity. But typically Jesuit, he sees the danger, okay? but he also sees the opportunity. And I think that's, I think that's uh, eventually what is what is really the biggest contribution of the society, to keep alive the spiritual ex- exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. St. Ignatius must really train you all well because that's also exactly what Father June just said a while ago. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we have learned a lot. We have learned so much from you, Father, and uh, we are so thankful to the Jesuits uh, <laughs> so, for everything that you have done for the country, not okay. just for the country, but for the, for the, whole, uh, for the whole world, in fact. <laughs> So thank you then, Father Jason, for making me your guest, for having me, and, and Margot also, thank you. And uh, I guess that's it. So Thank you so much, Father, for so enlightening Ignatius, us. Say bye-bye to you also. Goodbye. Oh, you again. St. Ignatius, I hope to see more of you <laughs> and learn more he's, from you. He still has hair. You see, he has hair. Because he's the, <laughs> he's the younger Ignatius. Very often, the Ignatius that depicts is Calvo. But that's the older guy, you know? The younger guy had... He said I was very uh, jealous about my hair and I used to fix my hair a lot. So he was, <laughs> when he was young, he was pretty vain. Yet, so in this but years, I think so. our audience should know that this was designed by you, Father. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh-oh. That this image was, tama po ba? It's an image that yeah, you... Yeah, yeah. I, I ideated it, but somebody, as a Mang Paloy Kagayat in, in uh, Paete Carve it for me. Yeah. Oh, Paete Carvers, they're the best. Yeah. Uh-oh. Okay, po. So thank you so much, Father Rene, for uh, enlightening oh, thank us. Thank you. Uh, and um, telling us all about the history of the Jesuits. And we hope to continue to be inspired by the Ignatian way. So thank you and thank you to all of our followers okay. and viewers for watching. Till the next in depth.